Access Minnesota, issues that matter to you. Access Minnesota brings you the newsmakers and the stories that shape our everyday lives with analysis from University of Minnesota faculty experts. Now, here's Jim Dubois. The Jean Nicholas Treader Collection in the University of Minnesota Library traces GLBT history through a wide variety of media and historical objects. This month on Access Minnesota, we'll hear how Jean Treader started collecting GLBT history. We'll also learn about a new grant and how it will help the library expand its focus on the legacy of transgender people in the Upper Midwest. The library's curator, Lisa Vicoli, tells us how the grant will enable the library to document transgender experiences, experiences that have often been left out of mainstream histories. Lisa Vicoli is a curator in the Treader Collection in LGBT Studies at the Elmer L. Anderson Library at the University of Minnesota. Lisa, welcome to Access Minnesota. Thank you for having me, Jim. Lisa, the Treader Collection recently received a grant to document transgender experiences in the Upper Midwest. But before we get into the details of the grant, tell us more about the Treader Collection. What's in the collection and how long has it been a part of the university libraries? Sure, thank you. Uh, the Treader Collection came to the university libraries in 2000. It had been collected much before that, um, but it came to the, the libraries in 2000. We have three main kinds of materials in the collection. We have books and periodicals that are published, so we have uh, tens of thousands of magazines, newspapers, full runs of both local publications, uh, national publications, and international publications. And uh, we also have books, uh, both fiction, nonfiction, reference books, um, so anything we can, we can add that's been published to add to an understanding of the GLBT experience. So that's our first category. Our second category is manuscript collections. Those would be the papers of individuals who have played an important role in the community. So we have some papers from Senator Alan Speer and, and Senator Scott Dibble. We have papers from Tony McNairn, who was a professor on campus. We have papers from Tobias Schneebaum, who was a noted anthropologist and studied the Asmat people. So those records all um, inform the history of the people that they come from and offer insights for people who are doing research into the community. And then the third category that we have is organizational records. So we have the records both of local Minnesota organizations, Outfront Minnesota, we just processed those, um, over 70 boxes of materials from Outfront Minnesota. We have Twin Cities Pride, we have the Minnesota AIDS Project, Minnesota Men of Color, Minnesota Philharmonic, um, a range of GLBT organizations in the state, and we're also the national uh, archive for several uh, national organizations, including the Log Cabin Republicans, the Lesbian and Gay Band Association, and others. So um, we have uh, the published materials, the manuscript collections, the organizational records, those are the big three, and then we have everything else. So we have buttons and t-shirts and posters and music and ephemera of all kinds that kind of fill out the collection. Tell us about Jean Nicholas Treader and his involvement in the GLBT community, particularly here in Minnesota and in the Upper Midwest. Sure. Jean was born in Minnesota, um, served in the Navy during Vietnam as a translator and a language specialist, and after the, his service was over, um, received an honorable discharge and returned to Minnesota and wanted to study at the university, wanted to pursue a degree in cultural anthropology studying the gay community. And unfortunately at that time, the university said that doesn't really exist. And so he wasn't able to do that. Um, but, it, but his interest in the gay community and in GLBT history, and not just locally, one of the things that I really admire about Gene was that he wasn't just looking at Minnesota or the United States. He really has a national, international perspective. So the collection has materials in 58 different languages because he wanted to show that the gay and lesbian experience was international, was universal across cultures and languages and continents. Um, so returned to Minnesota, uh, started collecting materials to show that there was such a thing as the gay community. He was involved in some of the early pride celebrations um, in Minnesota, which started in 1972. He was active in other GLBT organizations. He was active in local political uh, organizations and saved everything he could find that documented 
uh, his work and the work of the JLBT community. And after doing that for two or three decades, his apartment was full of stuff. He had stuff uh, in his fridge. He had archival stuff in his stove. His bed was covered. His sofa, he actually considered part of the collection because it was a gift from a, a gay community leader. And that was covered with stuff. So he would roll out his bedroll at night in the middle of the floor. And uh, there was a scare with a fire marshal. And there was concern that he was going to be in trouble with, uh, with the fire marshal. And th and the conversation started with the University of Minnesota about bringing the collection to the university libraries. Gene was convinced that it was important to bring it to an institution because it had gotten too large for anyone to pick up and carry on if something happened to him. And the university, uh, in the years after, uh, after turning down his uh, study request had changed enormously and was now offering studies in uh, gay and lesbian studies, gender, women, sexuality studies, and was convinced that having an archive of primary source material and research material would really add value to the experience it offered researchers and students in the community. So in 2000 the collection came to the Anderson Library. How unique is this collection? Are there any similar collections in libraries elsewhere? There are a few collections around the country, um, and even fewer around the world. They're, uh, the largest of the collections probably is One Archives, which is in Los Angeles. And they have recently formed an agreement, a relationship with USC. So they have gone from being an independent archive also to being associated with a university. Um, also in California, you have June Mazur, which is a lesbian archive, has a relationship with UCLA. Uh, you have in San Francisco the GLBT Historical Society. Uh, and some collections at the San Francisco Public Library. And in New York, Lesbian Her Story Archives in Florida, uh, the Stonewall Archives and Museum. But there aren't a lot of these collections. So New York Public Library has remarkable collections, but they don't have a specific archive dedicated to the GLBT community in the way that the Treader Collection is. How is GLBT history represented in the university's main larger library? Uh, we actually have a staff person at the university now who is a liaison dedicated to working with faculty and students on GLBT issues in addition to other topics. And it's interesting, we've gone through and done some searches in the collection to see what's there. And we found some real pockets of materials. We were doing a survey of some Scandinavian literature and some others. And we don't know who it was, but somebody back in the 40s, 50s, or 60s made some really interesting purchases and additions to the circulating collection that are GLBT oriented. And and I think had to have been done by somebody that was connected to the community because they're not the kind of materials that you would stumble on accidentally or that everyone would necessarily add to a general circulating collection. So I think we had somebody working in the library in the past who was able to add some materials that are really interesting to have now um, these decades later. So the general collection has good information and their role is to make that available and let that circulate. And our job is to add to that with rare and unique materials and then with the primary source materials like the manuscripts and the organizational records. Tell us about some of the GLBT histories that are uniquely represented here in the Treader Collection. One of the things that I really like talking to people about are the unique moments in GLBT history that have taken place in Minnesota. I think because of the density of both people and the density of press on the coasts, uh, people tend to associate uh, the GLBT movement or events in the community with New York or with California. And we have some, a real rich history to talk about, in, specifically in Minnesota, of things that have happened. And we're very fortunate to have records for many of those in the archive. So, for example, uh, Michael McConnell and Jack Baker were the very first couple in the United States to apply for a same-sex marriage license. They applied for a license in downtown Minneapolis on May 18, 1970 and their license was promptly denied. They received a tremendous amount of publicity and attention because of this, and as a result, they received letters from people all over the world, writing to them, saying, how did you find someone to love? How are you organizing in your community? Tell us what's going on. You know, God bless you for trying to do this. Um, thank you for raising this issue. And we now have their records 
which are a tremendous representation of what was going on all over the world in the early 1970s. So that's a moment that was, that's a Minnesota moment. Um, we also have Amazon Bookstore, which was in, in Minneapolis and was the first lesbian feminist bookstore in the country. And we have the records from Amazon Bookstore. There was a, an obscenity trial in 1967, uh, the DSI trial, two local men were accused of uh, production of obscenity. The trial took place in Minneapolis. Ron Meshbesher was the attorney, the defense attorney, and he's now given us the trial transcript and the defense exhibits from that case in 1967, which was an important case. So we have that material here. Um, and we also have a history, long history, of leadership in the community. Uh, the first uh, organization on campus for the GLBT community was free. It was formed in 1969 before the Stonewall Riots. Uh, FREE stands for Fight Repression of Erotic Expression. And it was formed on campus. They were doing same-sex dances in the early 1970s because then it was still illegal to dance with somebody of the same sex in the bars. So we have records of that. One of the things that we have, um, in addition to the other things I've talked about, are the records of elected officials. We've had a tremendous record in Minnesota of electing leaders in the, in the GLBT community to elected office. So we have some materials for Senator Alan Speer. Alan was one of the first people elected to a legislative office that was gay in the United States of America. So we're very proud to have materials for him. Um, we don't have very much from Representative Karen Clark, and I'm working on that. Uh, she was elected in 1980 and is now the longest serving uh, GLBT representative in the country. Uh, we, all, we do have the records of Senator Scott Dibble, who's currently in the Senate and is a real leader on GLBT issues. So Minnesota has, has elected a number of leaders in the LGBT community, and that's one of the things that we really want to have reflected in the archive. When Access Minnesota continues, we'll hear about the Tawani Foundation grant recently awarded to the Treader Collection and how the library will use the grant to record and document transgender experiences. Access Minnesota will return after these messages. You're watching Access Minnesota. Here's Jim Dubois. Now back to our conversation with University of Minnesota Library curator Lisa Vicoli about plans to expand the Treader Collection's resources for documenting transgender histories. The Tawani Foundation has awarded the Treader Collection a grant for a transgender oral history. Tell us more about that grant and the project it will fund. One of the things that I realized when I started working at the archive almost three years ago was that much of our material is, documents the experience of gay white men. And that's true of most GLBT archives around the world. That's where most of the revenue has been to produce magazines and newspapers. That's where most of the organizations have come from. Um, and so we have a lot of print material, a lot of organizational material from gay men. We have less from the lesbian community. We have less from people of color. And we have much less from the transgender and bisexual communities. And so I started trying to figure out how we could add material to the collection that would document the transgender experience. There's a tremendous amount of interest not only on campus but around the community right now in issues of gender, in the transgender experience, in the history about transgender and gender issues. And when people come to the archive and say, what do you have, I haven't had very much to offer them. And I've been very aware of our need to expand and diversify the voices that we have in the collection. So when we had the opportunity to ask Tawani Foundation for a grant, I drew up a project that would be an oral history project and would interview hopefully two to three hundred individuals and gather four or more hundred hours of oral histories that we could add to the collection that would let people speak for themselves. Because when people are doing research, when they're looking for answers, when they're trying to understand what's happened, if they can't find people's first-person accounts, if they can't find that narrative, they look someplace else. So they look to the mainstream newspapers or they look to the mainstream representations. And that doesn't let the community speak for itself. You, you get the story wrong when you do that. 
So my goal is really to let the transgender community speak for itself. We want to go back as far as we can. Um, the University of Minnesota was actually the second place in the country to do sex reassignment surgeries. We were a few months behind Johns Hopkins. So in 1967, there was a project on campus that did some of the first surgeries in the country. We would love to be able to document that if we can, find people who participated in that project if they're still available and willing to speak with us. We also want to talk about the role of the University of Minnesota. We, in, the 19, in 1967, had the, the, the project that was going on. And more recently, the program in human sexuality at the medical school is deeply involved in trying to, trying to promote a more healthy environment for human sexuality in all aspects, but also works with the transgender community, uh, with people who are thinking about transitioning, exploring gender issues. We want to document that role. And then we want to go out and talk to people in the community and let them tell their own stories. Starting with the people in the 60s, if we can find them, up to and including young people today who are frankly rejecting the concept of gender as a binary and they're saying it's not male to female, it's not female to male, I'm something in between, I, I reject those two choices, I want to be something else. So they're using the language of gender queer um, and really defining gender in a completely different way. So thinking about what, how we thought about gender 70 years ago when the, when the project started on campus, Thinking about people who are talking about it today, I cannot imagine how we're going to be talking about gender in another 50 or 100 years. But the best I can do is document the experience that people are having today in their own lived experiences in their own lives, how they've talked to people, how they felt about coming to terms with their own gender identity, what they did about that, what options they had, and, and, and really letting them tell their own stories. How do you plan to reach out to the transgender community to collect these oral histories? Well, we're going to be as creative as we can, uh, because if we don't be creative, we're just going to get the same story a hundred times over, and I don't want to do that. So we will be looking at um, uh, reaching out in every way that we can, and we also want to be creative about the way we do the project. So if people are willing to identify themselves, we want to talk with them. If people are willing to do a history but want to be anonymous, we're willing to talk with them as well. Um, we're looking at the possibility of having people maybe submit their own material so that they don't have to sit down with someone else and do it. So we want to be as creative as we can to overcome as many barriers that might stop people from participating. But we're already starting to do outreach when the, when the news about the grant was released. I immediately got about a dozen uh, emails from people who said, I'd like to participate, I'd like to tell my story, I'd like to help with the project, what can I do? So there's a real interest in the project and in people being able to tell their own stories. And what I hear from the people who've contacted me is, when I went through this, I was very alone, I didn't have support. Um, hearing from other people would have really been important for me, would have made a difference to me. I want to be able to provide that for other people. We'll hear more about the process of documenting transgender experiences in the Upper Midwest when Access Minnesota continues. Access Minnesota will return after these messages. You're watching Access Minnesota. Here's Jim Dubois. Here's more of our conversation with Lisa Vacoli, curator of the University of Minnesota's Jean Nicholas Treader Collection a library that specializes in GLBT histories. For this project, how do you define transgender and then determine who gets interviewed? Uh, I'm not going to determine transgender. I'm going to let, people are going to have to identify themselves. And we're not, like I said, we're not just looking at people who are transgender, which is traditionally understood as someone who was assigned one gender at birth and then determines during their lifetime that they, that they are a different gender. Um, they may or may not act on that. I mean, people handle that in a lot of different ways. Um, but we're now hearing from young people who are rejecting the concept of the male and female. They're talking about being gender queer. They're talking about being some combination of the genders. And all of those experiences help document the way people are talking about gender in their lives at this point and how they're feeling about gender 
uh, and we want to include all those voices. The grant is for research of transgender people in the upper Midwest. How exactly do you find the upper Midwest and what cities and states will be included? That's a work in progress. I think we're definitely looking at Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, probably the, the Dakotas. Um, and the outreach will be, um, again, as creative as we can make it. Um, but people find each other. And once you find one person and you say, who do you know? They know two people and they know four people and they know six people. I had a donor come recently and talk to me um, about some materials and they're in Fargo-Moorhead. And I talked about this project and they said, well, if you get the grant, let me know because I know a half dozen trans people in Fargo-Moorhead. And that's the way it's gonna happen. Do you foresee that the experiences of transgender people in these diverse areas and regions will differ significantly from one another? I haven't really thought about that. Um, I think um, that it may differ in the Midwest versus being in New York or California. It may differ in an urban area as opposed to being in an outstate area, but I think that's one of the things we'll, we'll uncover. What do you hope this project will provide for future scholars and researchers? You know, one of the things that keeps me awake at night is what, what questions we should ask. What, what, will, what will researchers want to know in a hundred years about the way we think about gender today? Um, I'm actually putting together an advisory group to help me think about what are the questions that we should be asking. Um, and I think we'll be talking about that and looking at that a lot. Um, and just to be clear, I won't be asking the questions. We're, we're going through a hiring process right now um, to hire someone to do this project, someone who's really familiar with the transgender community. Uh, because in an oral history, what you are able to draw from someone, what you hear from them, is often based a lot on their comfort with the person who's doing the interview. And I really want someone in this role who will be the best person to draw out stories and make people feel at ease and valued and like they want to really reveal things. Um, and what researchers get in a hundred years, I just hope they get the first person voices of people who are living their lives now and and the ability to understand. I think we've all seen documentaries where someone has asked the perfect question and you get the answer and you're like, I can't believe they thought to ask exactly what I want to know. And I hope that we're able to do that so that in a hundred years, somebody's watching an interview and says, that's exactly the question I wanted you to ask. That's exactly what I wanted to know about this person's experience. Lisa Vicoli is a curator in the Treader Collection for GLBT Studies at the Elmer L. Anderson Library at the University of Minnesota. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us on Access Minnesota. Thank you, Jim. It's been a pleasure. That's all for this month's edition of Access Minnesota. We'll see you again next month. Thanks for watching. Access Minnesota, issues that matter to you. Join us again next week as we bring you the newsmakers and stories that shape our everyday lives. Access Minnesota is produced by the Minnesota Broadcasters Association in cooperation with the University of Minnesota's College of Liberal Arts.